Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. Tonight, a special edition of our show, Youth Takeover. We'll be featuring the input and perspectives of Bay Area high school students as both the guests and interviewers. Like me, I'm Javeria Khan and I'm a junior at El Cerrito High School. I'm one of many high school students participating in KQED's productions. You may have heard our voices online, on radio, and now here on KQED Newsroom. And on this program, we'll discuss various issues before the U.S. Supreme Court, including immigration. Also, how e-cigarettes are being marketed, especially to youth. And something that's an important topic for students every day, school lunch. We'll begin with e-cigarettes. You may have seen people pull out a sleek pen-shaped device and puff on it. Those devices, e-cigarettes, are marketed as a healthier alternative to cigarettes since they don't emit smoke or tar. Instead, they heat a flavored liquid that usually contains nicotine into a vapor that users inhale. E-cigarettes are now a multi-billion dollar industry and their popularity is soaring among teens. According to the Centers for Disease Control, more than 2 million students in high schools and middle schools reported using them in the past month. This week, the FDA announced a nationwide crackdown on retailers who sell e-cigarettes to minors. The agency is also looking into how the devices are marketed to youth using candy-like flavors. Joining us now to discuss this issue are Dr. Mark Rubenstein, a professor of pediatrics at UCSF, who has been studying the health effects of vaping on teens. And our special young guest today, El Cerrito High School junior, Javeria Khan. Hello to you both. And Dr. Yeah. Rubenstein, I want to start with you. Your report released last month is the first study of its kind. What types of potentially cancer-causing chemicals did you find in teens who use e-cigarettes and at what levels? So we were looking at different chemicals that we know are carcinogenic in adult smokers, and we wanted to see if we could find those in teens who vape. And three in particular that I think some of the viewers might be aware of are acrolein, acrylonitrile, which has been in the press recently, and propylene oxide, all three of which have been associated with cancer. And although they were in lower levels than we found in kids who smoke cigarettes and vaped, they were still three times higher than our control group of kids who did not vape or smoke cigarettes. And what surprised you the most about your findings? I think I was surprised um, because many of the kids only reported vaping a few times a month and only one or two times a day. And I was surprised to even find those chemicals in them at such low levels of exposure. And as a doctor, what concerns do you have about the health risks of vaping on teens whose, whose bodies and, and brains are still developing? I, I'm very concerned about these products. Um, I know when I was a teenager, a lot of my friends tried smoking, and cigarettes sort of burned the back of their throat and made them smell funny, and their parents could smell it. Uh, these products don't burn the back of the throat, smell pretty good, actually, and a lot of parents don't even know what that smell is, so kids are able to, to vape at home. And unfortunately, because these products have nicotine in them, and nicotine is highly addictive, I'm afraid that many of these teens are going to become addicted to nicotine because of these products. But what about flavored e-cigarettes without nicotine? Are those dangerous as well? Well, we think that they are. In fact, in my study, we looked at some of those products as well and found the same cancer-causing agents in those products. It's not so much the nicotine that's causing these chemicals, it's the, it's the other solvents in the products. And Javeria, at your high school, El Cerrito High School, and within your circle of friends, do you see a lot of vaping? I definitely do. Not within my immediate circle of friends, but in classrooms sometimes. Um, Vaping products are easy to conceal, especially if they're jewel devices. They look like flash drives and pens, and they're easy to hide. Um, so I, I do see it. I think it's more evident on social media than it is in the classroom and on school campuses. So why do you think they do it? Um, so I spoke with three teenagers at our school this past week to talk to them about vaping and why they do it. And what they seemed to, to tell me was that the reason they do it is because it helps them uh, feel better about themselves and they feel more accepted in their friend group. They think that it is something that's cool. But also one of the students that I spoke with said that it helped calm her anxiety and it helped her deal with um, you know, her frustrations. Um, and I wonder if there's any truth to that. Um, there actually is some truth to that. So just like coffee, nicotine is a stimulant drug, and so it can wake you up if you're sleepy, and it can also relax you. 
Um, and add on top of that, if you are somewhat dependent on the nicotine, just like coffee, when you're not getting the nicotine, you can feel very nervous or edgy or antsy, and then you require nicotine to help calm yourself down. So it's addictive. Exactly. And, and so, you know, in California, Javeria, you have to be 21 to buy tobacco products. How are your friends and counterparts getting their hands on online. these things? Online. It's, it's for the most part online. On, and it's not just on um, websites that are specifically directed uh, for vape people that vape. It's on Amazon and um, eBay. And it's, they also buy it through their friends who access it online. So it's not just about getting it at the corner store anymore. It's, it's all done online. So this gets to the issue of marketing, right? Mark, this uh, week the FDA announced a nationwide crackdown on inter underage use of a popular brand, Juul, which now pretty much dominates the market for e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And the FDA is also investiga investigating the design and the marketing of its product. Uh, do you think the federal government is doing enough? I actually, I applaud their action. At least they're finally taking some action. But I do not think they're going far enough. I think that some of the flavors are clearly targeted towards teens, and that needs to be addressed. Um, already, the FDA does not allow flavored cigarettes because we know it targets kids. And so I think they need to crack down on the flavors right away. So they've got bubble gum, they've got strawberry shortcake. What else have you seen out there? Um, cotton candy, uh, we talked about rainbow, unicorn flavored. And you know, Jewel Labs is based in San Francisco. We did reach out to them, and they gave us this statement in response to the FDA's crackdown, uh, basically saying Jewel Labs agrees with the FDA that illegal sales of our products to minors are unacceptable. We are working with the FDA, lawmakers, parents, and community leaders to combat underage use. Mark, what do you make about, of that statement? Well, I'm glad that they made that statement. And I, I did notice that they are making some changes to their product line. They're starting to release more adult-friendly flavors. However, some of the kid-friendly flavors, like mango, which used to say for a limited time only, mm -hmm. are now just on there as a permanent flavor. Mm -hmm. So maybe they should start to get rid of some of the kid-friendly flavors and just focus on adult flavors. And Shaveria, the teens you know who vape, do you think they are aware of or even care about the health risks that Dr. Rubenstein have pointed, has pointed out? Well, based on what they said to me, they don't really, they're not really aware of the health risks. They know that some of these products do have nicotine and they know that there are really dangerous withdrawal symptoms um, that might impair their, their uh, abilities. But uh, for the most part, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that's not representative of the entire student body, but that's depending on the three, th three students that I spoke with. So what do you mean they don't care about the health risks? Well, they don't seem to think that these health risks are long term. And um, they seem to think that it is a safer alternative to mm -hmm. smoking marijuana or cigarettes, um, which is what they, they normally do. So what do you think it would take? to get them to stop vaping and using e-cigarettes? Well, I think um, there need to be more school-wide policies uh, that, that address vaping on school campuses. But they're definitely, schools need to do what they do best, and that's to educate. We need to have talks about vaping and the long-term effects and how dangerous it can potentially be for both the mind and the body. So I think that uh, an education way of approaching this would be the best. What do you think of that approach? What else needs to be done? I, I, I agree with you. I think pediatricians and teachers and parents need to inform teens of the risks of these products, just like we did with cigarettes. I think we had tremendous success in lowering the number of kids that are smoking cigarettes. And unfortunately, these products are taking the place of cigarettes now. So if we could help kids learn that these are also risky and that there should be nothing in your lungs besides air, I think we would go a great distance in, in helping to get kids off these products. And Dr. Rubenstein, what do we still not know about e-cigarettes that concerns you? Um, I think there's still a lot we don't know about the flavors, the chemicals that are used to make these flavors that we talked about, mm -hmm. the cotton candy, uh, the crazy mixed flavors. We just don't know what happens when you heat those chemicals to the temperatures required for vaporization and what happens to lung tissue when that when those chemicals hit your lung tissue. 
and a lot of those uh, chemicals are being studied right now so that we can hopefully learn this. Okay, still a lot of unanswered questions. Dr. Mark Rubenstein with UCSF, thank you very much. And Javeria, of course, thank you for being with us for thank this you. discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Turning now to the courts, this week a federal judge in Washington, D.C. ruled against the Trump administration on DACA, the program set up to protect from deportation undocumented immigrants brought here as children. In the ruling, U.S. District Judge John Bates called the move to end DACA, quote, arbitrary and capricious. The Trump administration now has 90 days to challenge the ruling. Otherwise, DACA could be completely reinstated. Also this week, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments on the Trump administration's travel ban. Joining us now with more on this and other legal developments is Professor Rory Little with UC Hastings College of the Law. Professor Little, always nice to have you here. Happy to be here. Thanks. Well, let's begin with DACA. With um, Judge John Bates' decision, it goes further than two other prior rulings, uh, putting uh, DACA on hold, because basically it's, it orders the Trump administration to accept new applications um, if it can't issue a new memo that's satisfactory to the judge within 90 days. Right. So my question is, what impact does this latest development have on all the various litigation out there over DACA? Well, the, the most important thing may be that Judge Bates gave 90 days to the Trump administration to revise its order. And if they can come up with a better explanation that sort of fulfills whatever his requirements might be, then the re revision or rescission of DACA would go into force. So it's a, it's a broad ruling because it says if you don't meet my requirements within 90 days, we're going to accept new applications as well as do the old ones. The current uh, other two cases say just the old ones. So this would be much broader. But, but it the, seems like he's giving them some leeway then, the Trump administration. Yeah, he's giving them three months to sort of come up with a new explanation. It's kind of like the travel ban case where they did one, it was really terrible, it was struck down all over. Two didn't work very well. Then they did three. Three seems a little better. They may do that with the DACA explanation. We'll see. Maybe Congress will also do legislation. That's the more important uh, place to play right now. And over the next 90 days, what do you think will be the Trump administration's main argument against keeping DACA? Well, they're going to say, oh, gee, it was unconstitutional before, and it's unconstitutional today, and uh, President Obama did it by executive order, and he can't do that either. They'll make these same arguments that you heard, uh, you know, two years ago. Um, but I think they'll also go to Congress and say, come on, you guys could do this with legislation and maybe we'll get some actual legislation, which would be valuable for everybody. But that's not going to happen within 90 days. Well, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so Congress rarely does anything within 90 days. No, but they do have the votes for this. The frustrating part is they do have votes for some version of DACA. They just can't sort of agree on the details and they put other things ahead of it. You're right. They, they, they in a sense, don't prioritize things the way maybe you and I would. Mm -hmm. Um, but they can do it. Um, we'll see. This summer is uh, recess time. You know, they're all gearing up for the midterm elections. Right. And meanwhile, two appellate courts uh, in Northern California and New York are also weighing cases on DACA. So does the ruling out of Washington this week by Judge Bates uh, change anything for those two cases? I think those two cases granted preliminary injunctions and said that uh, you have to at least process the old applications that were in on time. They didn't extend to accepting new ones. And those will continue, those cases will continue on towards some kind of trial or evidentiary hearing. But I think everybody now will wait and see what happens in the next 90 days. And I wanted to talk about the travel ban as well. You brought that up earlier. This week, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments on the travel ban. Lower courts have struck down each of the three iterations of this ban. Um, will President Trump fare better in the conservative, conservative leaning uh, Supreme Court, do you think? Well. He certainly will. I mean, if Merrick Garland were on the court, we'd have a different, uh, a different ball game. Um, but the order itself is much improved over the first one. I mean, it's a very difficult problem for the Supreme Court. If we didn't know who was president and if we didn't know what this president has said about Muslims and banning Muslims, uh, then maybe this order would pass. It's a very important executive branch power to control immigration and to control the borders and to be able to move quickly if they have to. But we do know this president, and we do know what he said. And this president said things that very clearly have a religious bias, uh, it seems to me. Um, so the court has to decide, are we going to write a decision that will withstand the test of time for all presidents, or are we really going to focus on this president? I think you'll see a five to four court, maybe six to three, but I think five to four. 
And the real question is, which way will Justice Kennedy go? He's always our fifth vote. Right. And will Chief Judge Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, take Kennedy with him, or will they split? And Javeria, you have a question on this as well. Yeah, I was wondering, what is the legal threshold that distinguishes religious discrimination from a decision that is based purely on national security? Well, the First Amendment is the big difference, right? Mm -hmm. The First Amendment says you cannot either establish a religion or interfere with the free exercise of religion. And generally, we interpret that to mean you cannot statutorily discriminate against religion. Uh, and you can't do that in lots of contexts that we're familiar with. Um, on the other hand, we do know that when national security is at issue, uh, the president has a lot of power. There are some very bad examples of that, right? The Korematsu case, which approved the internment of Japanese American citizens. Right. Uh, we view that today as a blot on our history. So sometimes the Supreme Court really needs to stand up and say no. Other times we want the Supreme Court to say, well, the executive should have their authority. This case mm -hmm. falls sort of right in the middle of that. And, and so a decision on this travel ban uh, should come sometime before the conclusion of the court's term in June. In the meantime, what other major cases are on their docket that are of special interest here in Northern California? Yeah, we tend to forget exactly what's happened. You know, uh, we, we're, we're, we're clouded by the current events. We remember the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which has to do with whether a cake maker can discriminate against, uh, you know, gay same-sex couples who want a cake made, can they say no? That's not uh, of Colorado, because the cake baker said that would violate his religious beliefs. He did say that, although there's a lot of dispute on the facts in this case. But that will, that will affect not just cake making, it will affect all sorts of private, industrial, commercial contexts where we do not usually allow discrimination based on protected categories. And the court has protected yeah. uh, same-sex categories. Justice Kennedy, again, will be a central person. Fourth Amendment. Can the government just get your cell phone information uh, without a search warrant uh, because it's, quote, shared with your cell company? Nobody really believes the cell company listens to your phone calls or your texts. But the, can the government get it just because the phone company has your sort of technological go big case? So there's a number of cases that will still be decided all before July 1st, which is when they usually finish. Okay, we know as always you will be watching it. I'll be Professor there. Rory Little with uh, UC Hastings College of the Law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Javeria, for joining me. We're going to give you a little bit of a break now as we transition to the next segment, okay? Great. Our next topic is one that's close to many a student's heart, food. Angel Brady is a sophomore at Fremont High School. Angel and two of her fellow students pitched us a story about school lunches. They did a photo essay and conducted interviews about where the food comes from and what students think of it. Stephanie Murphy, a senior at San Leandro High, also raised concerns about food at her campus, from how it tastes to rules that lead to waste. At Santa Clara High School, variety doesn't seem to be a problem. Students there get Indian pizza, roasted chicken, and plenty of fruits and veggies. But according to sophomore Alina Joffrey, the lines are too long and popular items frequently run out. All three join me now in the studio. Stephanie Murphy, a senior at San Leandro High School. Angel Brady, a sophomore at Fremont High. And Alina Joffrey, a sophomore at Santa Clara High School. Nice to have all of you here. Nice to be here. So, Stephanie, tell me about the school lunches at San Leandro High. What are they like? Well, the school lunch at my high school isn't too great. Um, they often serve expired milk. So, mm. um, have to double check the expiration date. Um, the pizza that they serve is usually uncooked. Like, the dough isn't fully cooked, so it's raw. Um, the fruit mushy and brown, most of it, a lot of times. Um, the peanut butter and jelly they serve, um, it's prepackaged and it's frozen most of the time. It's still frozen by the time you get it? Yes, hard as a rock. Okay. And um, the salads, I thought that would be a healthier alternative, but the chicken inside is very rubbery, very rubbery. So none of that sounds too appetizing. Alina, same experience at your school? Mm, actually, th hearing her answer makes me more grateful about my school's food. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variety, and the taste isn't too favorable, but it's not as bad as, mm -hmm. as what she's saying. And Angel, what's your experience like with your school lunches? Um, kind of just writing off what Stephanie is saying. It's A lot of the students just don't like it. Um, a lot of the food could be 
quite mysterious. We don't necessarily know what it is, <laughs> or it's kind of hard to identify it when they put it out there. Um, and just overall, it just tastes bad. So then what do you do? Do you just go hungry? Um, a lot of the times, I would just wait till I get home. I'd rather wait to get home and enjoy something rather than be at school and just eat something just to fill myself up. Same. Yeah, same, same with you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then how, if, if you're skipping lunch uh, and you're going hungry, how does this affect your ability to learn? Um, well, greatly. Um, and when I'm in class and I'm supposed to be like learning the lesson, I'm asking everyone in class if they have food yeah. that I can have mm -hmm. instead of paying attention. So your mind is on uh, food rather than on learning and whatever's in front of you, math, English, science, Oh yeah, whatever. no, it's not about that. It's about feeding my body. <laughs> How much of this is being a teenager? You know, sometimes teenagers don't eat lunch because yeah. it's not cool. All the older <laughs> kids mm -hmm. think, you know, they should be doing other stuff during their lunch breaks. So how much of this has to do with the quality of food and how much of, of it is just being a teen? Well, I think, I don't think that's the case for students at my school. Teenagers, they're just all about eating. But uh, the food at our school, um, you see long lines at the cafeteria all the time. But you don't exactly see students enjoying the food. Um, the, some of the food is good, but just some of the food students just don't like and they just don't want to eat. So that's basically the reason why some students just don't eat food at lunch. And, and many of the schools, though, there are mandatory rules where you have to pick up a fresh fruit or veggie in addition to your entree. Um, Angel, do you do that and do you actually eat everything on your plate? A lot of the time, there's only one thing that the students want on the plate. Um, so a lot of it does end up getting wasted. Yeah. yeah, so there seems to be a lot of food waste going on. But but how much? Yeah, of it's, it's a lot because, um, like you said, we get we sit in this long line just for usually one item, but they end up make you take um, three or four, and then you're left to waste it all. But, but some of the items that you're throwing away, uh, they're, the mandatory rules are there for a reason, right? Because mm -hmm. they're nutritious, that fruit, that vegetable. So, you know, how much of this is about, how important is nutrition versus taste for you? I think it goes hand in hand because um, maybe it's supposed to be nutritious, but I'm not exactly sure how nutritious the, the fruit they actually serve is. So I've just had too many bad experiences with mushy fruit, um, food that doesn't rot or just... Food that doesn't rot implies what to you? Preservatives, hmm. many preservatives. Um, I don't want that in my body, and so I try to eat fresh fruit, not from the school. And I know Angel uh, and Alina, you both have been uh, proactive on this. Angel, you went to your school administrators and tried to find out more about where the food comes from. What did you learn? When I spoke with Allison Hill, our school's vice principal, she wasn't able to give me a lot of information as to how the food is being processed and how nutritious it is. Um, she was just telling me how she didn't know a lot of information about it, and I feel like that that's a problem because administration and staff at our school should definitely know what's being provided or given to the students or how healthy it is and how it could affect the students. And Alina, what did you find out mm -hmm. when you did some reporting? Uh, it was more of the opposite for me. Um, the admins seemed to know a lot about what was going in their body, and they were a lot more into it. They loved the variety, and uh, the nutrition's director that I talked to, Karen Luna, she was talking about how she just wants the best for students, and she just wants all the food that the students want to see. And you also reported on a new program where the school district is growing its own produce on a farm? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, they started in August. They've been uh, growing lots of variety, and that's basically where all our produce comes from. It comes from local farms and mostly our district farm. So that's why produce is more favorable, in my opinion. I prefer the produce a lot more compared to the meals. So it's making a difference. You're actually mm -hmm. eating the produce yeah. at Santa Clara High School. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some of the other approaches or innovative changes that you would like to see schools make that would get you to eat school lunches? Definitely growing your own food. Uh, seeing that it comes from the ground with no added preservatives would definitely make um, me and I feel like my fellow, my fellow students want to eat it. And Angel? If we got the students more involved in how the food tasted, if we could have student taste testers or just, just students to kind of voice their opinion on 
how they like this meal or if, if it should even be served in the cafeteria just mm. to um, give more student like students should have the option to like suggest if they're okay with this being served in their cafeterias. Okay. And as you um, speak to other classmates, how big an issue is this on campus, the fact that the students are not eating, they're going hungry? Um, it's big because administrators are always telling us to eat healthy, but then you serve us bad food, which makes us not eat, which makes us go buy hot chips um, at the corner store, and they were eating hot chips for breakfast and lunch, yeah. which aren't nutritious at all. Same experience with you mm -hmm. at your schools, a lot yeah. of kids just choosing not to eat? Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of students, they want to get lunch from the cafeteria, they wait in that line to get food, but they just end up not being into it and just rather preferring hot chips at the corner store. And so where, where do you see this going from here? I know that you've been very mm -hmm. active in reporting on this. What are you trying to push administrators to do next? Um, I think to be less wasteful, when students uh, look at the meal, they think, oh, that looks good, let me try it. They don't like it and they just throw it out. I think it would be interesting if a student could try the food beforehand. So instead of um, buying it and not liking it and throwing it away, they could be like, oh, that's not good. Let me just get this grilled cheese that I always like for lunch. So they always have something to eat and not have to waste food. Okay, well, it's been very interesting to get your perspectives on this. Thank you so much, Stephanie Murphy with San Leandro High School, Angel Brady from Fremont High, and Alina Joffrey from Santa Clara High School. Thank you all. No problem. Thank you. Hey, Javeria, thank you so much for being part of our show. Well, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here and to be a part of the Youth Takeover. It has been a great fun experience for all of us. Yes. And as always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. And I'm Javeria Khan. Thank you for joining us.